Our speaker this morning is Dr. Stephen Bramer. He serves as professor of Bible exposition and the chair of the Department of Bible Exposition. Uh, Stephen has a special interest. If you're around him at all, you know he loves the land of Israel, uh, the Middle East, and uh, travels there extensively. He serves as an adjunct professor at the Jordan Evangelical Theological Seminary, uh, the Word of Life Bible College in Hungary, outside of uh, Budapest, and the Montana Wilderness of the Bible in his time when he's not teaching full-time here. In addition, uh, he ministers as the teaching pastor of the Waterbrook Church, Waterbrook Bible Fellowship in Wiley, Texas, a church he helped plant 10 years ago. Uh, this year, he and his wife Sharon celebrate 40 years of uh, marriage and are the grateful parents of three children and the proud grandparents of seven grandchildren. Grateful parents, proud grandparents. That's a good combination. He loves the word, both the written and the living word. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Bramer to our platform today? And if my daughter-in-law keeps the schedule, eight grandchildren next month, so I'm very, very excited about that. You can imagine how I felt on Tuesday morning when Dr. Mark Bailey began to speak on God's faithfulness and we sang, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Since the previous week I had handed in my message uh, topic for this week, the faithfulness of God, and I had asked to sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <laughs> and um, I, I began to get worried as he was speaking and then I eased off. I thought, well, I'm just going to share with you some material from the latest book that I've written, and uh, it's uh, the Bible Reader's Joke book uh, that came out in October. <laughs> and I didn't think anyone would fear uh, if I read, and I looked in Lamentation, I've got very few jokes in Lamentation, apparently. It doesn't lend itself to a great deal of humor. But as I talked to members of uh, the Bible Exposition Department, they encouraged me that uh, I should go ahead and share, and I do believe that God has a message for us. I hope you've come expecting a word from the Lord. I've come expecting God to speak to me and hopefully uh, through me. I have had great time in the four seminaries that I've attended. Uh, some of us can get through a little bit quicker, but uh, at, at Tyndale Seminary in Toronto, I just loved my time there. We were newly married and uh, there was a professor there, actually, from Dallas Theological Seminary, had graduated and just loved Dr. Matheson's classes as we went through the scripture. It was just a wonderful time. We had no kids. I was a youth pastor, owned a motorcycle. It was just kind of wonderful. <laughs> I just got given a motorcycle this past summer, a uh, um, uh, 1300 uh, big uh, touring bike. And um, I asked my wife if I could accept it as a gift, and she said, yes, but I think she's upped my life insurance. Uh, <laughs> I went to a Tyndale Seminary, Tyndale College at the University of Toronto, and I remember sitting in an early morning Anglican prayer service beside Dr. R. K. Harrison, uh, a professor who I had admired, and sitting in his class and having a chance to talk to him about spiritual things, sometimes in an atmosphere where a lot of uh, my more conservative views were, were not welcome, but speak to Dr. R. K. here. So it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful time. I went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School to uh, do my Master of Theology and um, loved it there to talk to Dr. Walter Kaiser and to have him continually reminding us, put your finger on the verse, put your finger on the verse. Coming back from chapel and saying, Dr. Kaiser, what did you think of that message? And he said, um, good message, wrong passage. <laughs> and I remember thinking, whoa, I've got to be careful, because he wanted the finger on the verse. It, it was great. And coming to Dallas Theological Seminary, uh, my very first class in PhD program, I had two professors, Dr. J. Dwight Pentecost and Dr. Stanley Toussaint, in the classroom at the same time. And I remember just being in awe. They gave us 20 questions to prepare for the next week. I spent an hour on each question. Uh, I thought I was prepared. Dr. Pentecost asked me to uh, make a presentation, one of them, and when I got done, he said, is that all you have? And I'm thinking, yes, that's all I have. It was uh, really fun. And, and, and the things that went around around the seminary, 
The first social I ever attended here at Dallas Theological Seminary was actually a local church. It was a bunco party where you roll dice, and being fairly conservative and Plymouth Brethren in my background, I wasn't too sure about this, but I looked over, and there was Dr. John Walford sitting at a table, and I said to my wife, let's go over and roll dice with Dr. John Walford. <laughs> God's honest truth, he rolled the dice and got 666. And <laughs> Like, I just didn't know what to do, you know what I mean? Like, I, I was just all, uh, seminary has been uh, wonderful. Some of the best times I've had spiritually, some of the best times I've had relationally, not only with professors, but with fellow students. Some of the students I went through seminary with are still my best friends, had a chance to talk with someone over the Christmas holidays who we had been students together. But my time at seminary was also sometimes a discouraging, depressing, difficult, dark time. I can remember when I was coming down to Dallas Theological Seminary from Cairnport, Saskatchewan, 1,500 miles. We bought an old school bus to load our stuff on. First place we stopped, the water pump broke. I remember just saying, Lord, if you've called me, <laughs> then why don't you make it easy? And getting here and not having sufficient money to buy food for our family by November and having our young daughter, Charity, go to work and um, bring in the money. She paid for our family's food for two and a half years while I was here at seminary. Her voice on 50% of all Barney the Purple Dinosaur shows. If you've heard I Love You, You Love Me, you've heard our daughter sing. And she used to sign her check every Tuesday morning or afternoon when she came home from school and hand it to me and I'd buy food for the family and I remember being discouraged and, and grateful for God's goodness and, and yet discouraged and, and, and when my medications for my kidney uh, transplant got held up at the border because they thought I was importing drugs from Canada and, 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 and two days away from having to say, I, I just actually need this medicine to continue to live and, and it coming through. Finding out that a family member had chosen to lead an unbiblical lifestyle. Coming home and talking to your wife and realizing you're on different pages right now and you're not communicating. And here I am, a, a PhD student at Dallas, and I'm supposed to have my marriage together and, and, and saying to my wife, we need to get some counseling and coming down to a counselor here at DTS. Best thing I ever did for my marriage. I humbled myself a little bit. I shouldn't have been proud. But sometimes when we think we uh, know what's in the word, that we, we think we don't need help from other people. But it, it, it was a difficult time. I failed my first German competency exam. And I wondered. I remember coming home from Trinity with tears in my eyes. Dr. Gleason Archer was making me take, take Arabic. I went in twice to drop the course. He was my advisor. He refused to drop, sign the drop slip. And I remember coming home just with tears in my eyes saying, I, I can't do it. I will never use Arabic anyways, Lord, so why do I have to take it? Of course, 10 years later when I went over to Jordan, I wish I had paid a little more attention to the Arabic. <laughs> Great times and sobering times, and not only sobering times, difficult times. And it's all part of the Christian life, and it's all part of seminary life. And I am so grateful to those of you who are here this morning for the first semester. You're going to have just some fantastic times. But we need to also prepare for the fact that we may experience some times that are maybe just not quite as wonderful as we thought. And our question will be, God, are you still with me? Did you lead me here? Can I count on you? God, are you faithful? We just finished singing that wonderful, wonderful hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Oh God, my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. You don't change. You don't fail. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That is such a great hymn to sing at the beginning of a semester. Will you still sing it in April? 
It's great to sing it at graduation. Will you sing it when you fail a paper? It's great to sing at a wedding. Will you sing it if your spouse decides to walk away? Has God become unfaithful because of some of the difficulties of life? And in the book of Lamentations, we have this wonderful book made up of, of a series of laments, five different laments, done in a wonderful, complex, acrostic style. Chapter 1 has 66 lines in it. Those little dotted are for additional lines. But every third line starts with a subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph and Beit. And, Gil. and so we have a, a message here that is being written, I think, very carefully. It's not merely an emotional outburst. But here in chapter 1, we have a description of the devastation that has come upon the city of Jerusalem. The city that the prophet Isaiah said would be raised up into which all nations would stream. Micah says that as well. And now here the author says how lonely sits the city that was full of people. How like a widow she's become. She was once great among the nations. She who was princess among the provinces has become a slave. Jerusalem sinned grievously. Therefore she became filthy, and all who honored her despised her, for they've seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. Her uncleanness was in her skirt. She took no thought of her future. Therefore her fall is terrible, and she has no comforter. O Lord, behold my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. In chapter 1, we have both a narrator and the city of Jerusalem itself describing the devastation that has come upon them because of their sin. And the author goes on in chapter 2 to again do an acrostic. And this time here, the pay and the iron are, are reversed in, in the order, but it's still an acrostic. I've only got down to verse 6. It goes all the way down to verse 22, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, 66 lines, 66 lines. And here in chapter 2, the devastation is seen in its totality. And the anger of the Lord is seen. Are they going to be able to say God is faithful in the middle of this? How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He cast her down from heaven to earth. The splendor of Israel. He's not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy. Well, it's sometimes difficult to read these verses. But this is what they were experiencing. They were not experiencing the blessing of God right now. They were experiencing his judgment because of their sin. In wrath, he's broken down the stronghold of the daughter of Judah. He's brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. God um, talks that he is angry with these people. A a and this author very carefully puts it in acrostic style. I think that's so that during the whole exile time, the people could remember this. It, it's easy to remember blessings. Sometimes we don't remember the discipline quite as much. And at the end of the exile, he wants the people to be coming back and enjoying Jerusalem and the, the city of God once again and the city of the great king and, and the temple. And, and they need to remember why they were, went into exile because they had sinned. They had disobeyed. In chapter 3, he continues on, this time with a very, very complex acrostic where there are 66 lines. We in our versions have 66 verses, but every three sets of three all begin with a subsequent letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's designed in such a way that, that you can't remove any of these verses. And you see in chapter 3 now, it's an individual probably Jeremiah, but we don't know for sure, an individual who, as a righteous person, is experiencing some really tough times because of what others have done in the nation and the devastation that's come upon the nation, but he's part of it. And he's sitting there in Jerusalem, seeing the devastation. One of the great difficulties in my life is when I'm experiencing something because of the actions of others. It's difficult. I just think, God, God, can't you control those people? And can't you do it? And, and this is unfair. And God, you're not being faithful to, to, to me. 
But here he says, I am the man who's seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He's driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again all the day long. Uh, he's experiencing a situation uh, that he's having a hard time uh, working through why God has treated him this way. I've had a number of those experiences in my life. Why God? See, it's easy to sing great is thy faithfulness when the money comes in. It's harder to say, God, you're faithful, but I'm hungry. It's easy to sing great is thy faithfulness when people are applauding. It's more difficult to sing great is thy faithfulness when you feel you're under some attack. And in the Christian life and in the life of the seminary student, you're going to sometimes be part of a situation, part of a church that is not honoring the Lord the way they should. Part of a nation that is not honoring the Lord the way they should. And, and, and we may experience some things because of that. And, and what will we do then? I'm going to come back to the middle of chapter 3, but take a look at chapter 4. In, in chapter 4, we have an acrostic, but now he just has 44 lines. He still uses the 22 verses, but each line now only, each verse only has two lines rather than three lines. And he returns to the judgment themes of, of chapter 1. And um, he, he says, uh, verse 11, the Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger. He kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor any of the inhabitants of the world, that a foreign enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. They didn't think that because they thought God was going to protect them, but they have. This was for the sins of her prophets, for the iniquities of her priests who shed in her midst of her the blood of the righteous. But at the very end of chapter 4, he says, the punishment of your iniquity, O Jerusalem, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. There is hope because this judgment of God will not last forever. The exile will come to an end. Will they be ready to return? Have they listened? Have they learnt from his discipline? Have they recognized that his discipline is an act of love on God's part? probably heard the story of the little boy who was about to get uh, spanked by his father and his father said, son, I'm doing this because I love you. The little boy looked up at his father and says, I just wish I was big enough to return your love. <laughs> you know, be because at the time, at the time, we certainly don't feel that it's an act of love, but God has got loving kindness towards us. And God being faithful means he does bring the consequences of their sin upon them. If he hadn't brought the judgments, God would not have been faithful. And so we love some of the promises of God that appear to be blessings. Sometimes we don't like some of the promises of God that appear to be discipline. And in chapter 4, he announces the end. And then in chapter 5, we don't have an acrostic. We have 22 verses. And in chapter 5, we have very short, brief plea for restoration. <laughs> uh, uh, an urgent plea. Remember, O oh Lord, what's befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Verse 15, the joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. So in verse 22, restore us to yourself, O oh Lord, that we may be restored. Renew us Renew our days as of old, unless you've utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. Say, well, why did the author take such care to develop this acrostic, this lament, this funeral dirge? When I look at it, it kind of reminds me of some papers that students have handed in. Chapter one is when they started the paper two days before and they thought they would impress me by having a very, very good development, an acrostic all the way through. A day before, they still continue it in chapter two. The night before, they figure everybody else in the class may be doing an acrostic. I should really impress the prof. Let me do an acrostic for every verse. Now it's four o'clock in the morning, you get chapter four, and they say, if I use a big font, maybe I can just do two lines rather than three. <laughs> 
They fall asleep and they wake up in the morning and chapter five is due, so they just put down 22 things and hand it in and hope that I'll have given you the A when I saw chapter three and didn't get to chapter. No, I, I think it is so that the people will be able to remember this, that they will have a structure, but it's going to end incomplete. It doesn't end with a nice chord. It ends with a seventh chord where you're saying, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? And what's going to happen will depend upon whether the community has acknowledged what the individual author in chapter 3 has acknowledged, and that is that there is hope if you believe in the Lord and you trust in Him. So in chapter 3, he begins by saying, but this I call to mind, and therefore have hope. In the midst of, of darkness, in the midst of discouragement, what truth will you turn to? Are you going to turn to your own ability? Are you going to turn to your own reputation? I'm telling you, if you turn to anything else except the truth that is found in God's word, you will find yourself lacking hope for the future. And the truth that he turns to is found in the next verse when he says, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. Say, but we're under discipline. He says, yeah, God loves you. God loves you enough to discipline you. God loves you enough to bring attention to you as a nation that you have sinned and therefore there are consequences. You're not in fellowship. The steadfast love, the hesed of the Lord never ceases. This is his loyal, covenant-keeping love. A truth that you will have to remember throughout your seminary time is God loves you and he'll never stop loving you. If you listen carefully to our president on Tuesday, you'll realize that this is one of the faithful statements of God. God is faithful. He will love you and he will keep on loving you. And his mercies will never come to an end. You can't out -sin God. His mercies are there. They are there. It doesn't matter what we've done. His mercies never come to an end. He is a merciful, loving, gracious God. It doesn't mean that there aren't consequences, but he always has his arms open. And the author of this is saying, I need to, what am I going to do when I'm discouraged, when I feel that people are against me, when I feel I'm in darkness? He says, I'm going to remember some truth, and I'll have hope. God loves me, and he's merciful towards me. In fact, his mercies are new every morning. I think some of us um, don't realize that and don't look for it and don't recognize the mercies of God in the midst of darkness. I'm thinking, what would Je if this is Jeremiah, what, what mercies would he have when he gets up in the morning and the walls are all broken down and there's ash all over? And the fields are no longer growing crops. And there are no sheep in the pen. Like Habakkuk, there's nothing there. Nothing there. How will he say God is merciful? God loves him. God has a plan for him. God will be with him through the midst of the dark times. Actually, when I look back at how the Lord has led me in my years at seminary, well, I, I remember with great delight those wonderful times and exciting times. It's the dark times when God was there with me in the midst of darkness that keep me now and that, that make me uh, love him just so much more. I want to encourage you as students to take time each day to understand that God has been merciful to you. Do you realize that there are students around the world who would actually give up everything they own to be able to come and sit in a classroom and not be afraid and have a copy of the scriptures in front of them? Say, yeah, but I had a small breakfast this morning. They're saying, you got the Bible in front of you. You've got brothers and sisters around you. This past December, my wife and I were very, very convicted that we were going to buy each other Christmas presents that we didn't need, but they were to express our love, and we were prepared to do that, and there's nothing wrong. We've done it for many years. But Sharon and I began to talk and realized that 
there are brothers and sisters in Christ who are in Iraq and they're being threatened to either become Muslim or to pay a huge fine or, or to leave. And I think about a thousand of those families have now left and come into Jordan. And so my wife and I, uh, we, we prayed about it and, and we took uh, all the money that we we're gonna spend on each other and a little bit more and found a mission organization that would pay the rent for a Christian family for two months in Jordan and give them food for two months to help them get in their feet. And so that was our Christmas present to each other. And I hope in June to be able to see that family that we've been able to help in a small way. I'm thinking, have they seen the mercies of God? What mercies would they see if you're a Christian in Iraq this morning? And in many other places of the world. And, and I think sometimes what we do is, is we look at, at the blessings and we're North Americans and we come to expect that we won't just get daily bread, but it'll be steak and mushroom. That we won't just get shelter, it's a condominium with a pool. <laughs> that, that we won't just get clothes, it, we get the latest fashions. And unless God comes through in those ways, we, we somehow think we, we don't have it very good. I'm thinking the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. I need to recognize the mercies of the Lord. He gave the children of Israel manna morning by morning. And uh, we pray, give us this day our daily bread. These days I'm praying for low-calorie bread, but, you know, (laughs) something to, they're new every morning because great is thy faithfulness. For God to be faithful means he won't lie. For God to be faithful means that he will keep his promises. That this author is writing and saying, God, you are true. Therefore, I'm going to trust you. You are faithful. I think that sometimes if I'm not careful, I claim promises that were never given to me in the scripture. I I, I just somehow assume that since I'm living in 21st century North America, God will provide certain level of, it, it's at least middle class, if not upper middle class, and I think God would like me to be lower, upper class. And, and I forget, it, God hasn't promised me that. God hasn't promised you that you'll pass every class. He's promised to be faithful to you as you learn his word and you get to know him. I think some of us would rather pass than get to know him. A few years ago, I had a young lady come into my office and she said, uh, just wanted to talk to you. She said, I'm an A student, but you gave me a B in your paper, on my paper. I said, yes. She said, but I'm an A student. I said, but you did a B paper. And she said, well, but I'm an A student. And, and we sat back and forth. I'm wondering, are we talking the same language here? Finally, I said to her, what would you like me to do? She said, I'd like an A in my paper. And I said, no problem. I said, grades are really cheap for me to give, actually, so I can change that to an A. For the rest of your life, you'll know you got something you didn't deserve. Do you want it? And I bet you she sat there for five minutes in my office trying to decide whether she should get an A because that's what she wanted or whether she should get a B because that's what she deserved, in in my opinion. And finally, finally, she said, I'll take the B. And I thought that's probably one of the biggest lessons for her here at seminary. Because it's not that God has brought us here to give us A's. Praise God if you can do that. And I'm not suggesting in any way that if God has given you blessings above and beyond with the basics that he's promised that you shouldn't be thankful. But sometimes we come to expect a level of living and a level of success in ministry and a level of, of uh, material possessions that, that are so much more that we can't even see the little mercies of God day by day. There's some Christians who are claiming healing and a number of other things in this life that God has never promised and when they don't get it, it looks like God hasn't come through. And this author is saying, in the midst of darkness and in the midst of depression, in the midst of of, of what I would love to have and I've been praying about it, Lord, I'm going to continue to trust that you love me that your mercies are here if I would just recognize them, that that they're new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. I've made a commitment to my wife Sharon, we'll celebrate 40 years this uh, summer. We were 21 years of age when we got married, of course, very mature. Uh, 
I look back and think, if any of my kids had suggested they get married at 21, I'd have just shot them. Uh, but we, we, <laughs> and I wear a ring on my left hand to remind me that I'm married. When I was in Israel, I found another little ring with Hebrew on it that says, I am my beloved's and my beloved is, is mine, and, and I wear that. And I carried around in my pocket for over 21 years a piece of paper to remind me that I have made a commitment to Sharon. A piece of paper's fallen apart. It's all, you can't even read it much anymore. It's been in my wallet for 41 years. I signed a piece of paper that said, I'm gonna marry Sharon and I believe that God wants me to be faithful to her and I'm gonna love her for the rest of my life. Why do I have that piece of paper in my wallet? So that every time I open it up, every once in a while I actually glance at it and remember, I'm doing, buying something, doing something here, am I still loving my wife? I, I have rings to remind me that, that I'm committed because I forget, I forget, God never forgets. God doesn't need a little piece of paper. It doesn't need a ring. God has promised to you that he will be faithful. And he'll be faithful not only today, but he will be faithful in the days to come. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. The word portion is for the land, the allotment that they had gotten. And and he's saying, you know what? Something is more important than material possessions land. The Lord is. The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I'll hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for, those who who desire, who long for, who look for him, to the soul who seeks him. There is truth that is available to you and to me in the midst of trouble. I hope you never have trouble in life, but you will, because we live in a fallen world, and we live with fallen people, and we're fallen ourselves, and when the trouble comes, Some Christians have turned their back on the Lord, turned their back on community, decided it's time to quit. And I want you to remember that in the midst of trouble, there is truth. And the truth is, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is God's faithfulness. If you remember that, When the tough times come, you'll learn from the tough times, you'll go through the tough times, and you'll fall more in love with the God and Savior that we serve. Let's pray together. Father, we declare to you that you are faithful. You have never let us down. Father, we we sometimes thought you were because we had wrong expectations wrong application, wrong interpretation. But Father, you have been faithful to your promises in both disciplining and in bringing wonderful, wonderful blessings to us. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ here at Dallas Seminary that you will allow them to see you always as the God who loves them and the God who is merciful to them, the God who is faithful to them. And Father, I don't know what lies ahead of some of my family members here. I'm sure some of them are going to go through cancer. Some of them will lose a child. Some of them will experience deep darkness far more than I ever have. And Father, I'm praying that we would remember that there is truth in the midst of trouble. There is hope, even when it seems so dark. Give us faith. Give us remembrance of you. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.